Uh, most of the New Testament we have in an early 3rd century text with numerous fragments from the 3rd century and ever-increasing numbers of fairly complete Greek texts of the New Testament from the 4th century and several complete 4th century manuscripts in different languages which were translated from the original text in 2nd to the 4th century. We have over 20,000 quotes from the New Testament in other writings in the 1st to the 3rd centuries. In short, the textual evidence for the wording of the modern New Testament is incomparably better than any other ancient work and there's no reasoned argument against this. And so what we have is an accurate reconstruction of the original text of the New Testament. So we can rely on that text. Then we have archaeological evidence, and much modern archaeology has verified many, many details of the New Testament. There's no such thing as an archaeology which has proved the Bible. Neither is there archaeology that has disproved the Bible. The Bible will not be proved or disproved by archaeology, but there are many details of the Bible that have been proved accurate from archaeology. And the more they know about archaeology, the more the Bible is established as being a credible document. And so, for example, in Luke's Gospel, we discover that Luke correctly refers to 15 different titles for different Roman governors. Now that is remarkable. There were spies in the Second World War who were found out because they didn't know that the universities, the different colleges in the University of Cambridge were headed up by people who were, the leaders were called different names. And uh, they didn't understand that and they were tripped up in the war as a result of that. And so here we have remarkable accuracy and modern archaeology has demonstrated this. So there's a reliability about this. Now in the 19th century, most scholars thought that the bulk of the New Testament was not written in the, in the first century. They were pretty sure that the New Testament, the bulk of it, was written much later on than that. But 20th century archaeology has forced modern scholars to the conclusion that the New Testament was written much, much earlier. The historical, topographical, and archaeological accuracy of the Gospels means that most experts now accept that the New Testament was written between A.D. 45 to A.D. 70. So that this would be rather like a man in his 60s writing today about the main events in his 30s. Nobody would question his ability to write accurately about the events he saw firsthand. So if somebody wrote a book in their 60s about the main events of his life in, when he was in his 30s, nobody would question, say, oh, no, 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 that, that can't be true. You, it, this is a legend. So this means that the Gospels provide the earliest and the best and the most accurate record of Jesus, and there's absolutely no archaeological evidence at all that discredits them in any way. Then there is independent evidence. All this is showing that our faith is, is reasonable. We're not just saying you've got to believe this blindly. This makes sense. It actually happened. Jesus came, and here's the evidence for that. Now, independent evidence, that means evidence about the life and ministry of Jesus outside of the Gospels and outside of the New Testament writings. Now, it stands to reason that, as most of the early church, they met in homes and, and they, they didn't build buildings, not until, the end of the, not until the second century. They rejected statues and so forth. You, archaeologists have not found many early monuments which mention Christ, but they have found an AD, an AD 49 inscription in Galilee, which threatens the death penalty for anyone who removes a body from the tomb. Why is that, we wonder? AD 50. Tombs in Jerusalem which are engraved with Jesus' help and Jesus let them arise on them. Tombs containing Christian symbols and inscriptions which have dated to uh, A.D. 79 in Pompeii and A.D. 95 in Rome. So we do have re evidence that the gospel records and that this whole event of Jesus is not just something that is in the imagination of a few Christian believers. It actually happened. It's real. Now, obviously, it's unlikely that non-Christian sources would record Jesus' miracles and resurrection. 
We do have, of course, Josephus, the Jewish historian, recording a lot about the life and miracles of Jesus, but uh, he is not really credited very much as being a very good historian, probably because he did, it, did that kind of thing. But anyway, the point is, is that we do have many Jewish and Roman writings which mention Jesus and his followers. And these writings date from A.D. 50 to A.D. 150, and they all record, they, they report, for example, that Jesus lived in Judea. He kept and taught high moral standards. People ascribed miracles to him as his followers. Jesus' followers regarded him as Messiah or a divine figure. He was put to death under Pilate. He was crucified. In A.D. 64, his followers were falsely blamed by Nero for a great fire in Rome and were persecuted. For example, the Roman historian Tacitus, who died in A.D. 120, wrote that the Emperor Nero inflicted the most cruel tortures on a group of people detested for their abominations and popularly known as Christians. They got their name from Christ, who was executed by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. This checked the pernicious superstition for a short time, but it broke out afresh, not only in Judea, where the plague first arose, but in Rome itself. So what do we have here? We have a Roman historian recording many of the facts that the Gospel also speaks about. And so the Gospel stories are not just invented, they speak so much about history, because they actually happened. Now, when we come to the evidence for the resurrection, it's obvious that uh, this resurrection message was disbelieved. It was disbelieved amongst the Jews, disbelieved amongst the Gentiles. Paul, when he went to Athens, was mocked because of this. It was not a popular Greek concept, the resurrection. And in some circles, it wasn't popular amongst Jews, and certainly not popular to suggest that this Jesus, who was hung on the cross, was resurrected. So this is an event that cannot be explained uh, scientifically. It's going to take more than some kind of scientific uh, uh, investigation to explain this. But on the other hand, the five accounts in the New Testament show some very, very convincing things. Now when we look at the New Testament accounts of the resurrection, some people say these accounts discredit themselves because they seem to conflict with each other. There are differences. But before we discredit the gospel record because of these apparent differences, let's notice a number of things. First of all, no one gospel tells the whole story. They don't give all the details, introduce all the characters and so forth. And they look at the story of the gospel from their own perspective. What we do have is a series of descriptions from the same event, of the same event, from different viewpoints. So this is rather like looking at a mountain from different aspects of the compass point. You see different views, but it's the same mountain. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, exactly as that. And in John's Gospel, for example, with the resurrection stories, he mentions Mary Magdalene, Salome, Mary, and the wife of Cleopas at the cross, but only Mary Magdalene at the tomb. And yet, the plural in John's Gospel 20 and verse 2, shows that Mary was not alone, but he doesn't mention the others. And so it is the same. We can compare all of these things time and time again because of incompleteness. You don't have all the details. And you've got to put the Gospels together before you get the complete picture. Then there is a telescoping. Did you notice that when you read the Gospels? That the resurrection appearances and the ascension, all in Luke's Gospel, just seem to happen all at once seems to happen all in the same day. And yet Acts, that is also written by Luke, makes it clear that it was spread over a period of 40 days. So Luke, for his purposes in the Gospel, telescopes these events and doesn't spell out in detail the time scale. But the same writer who knows about this actually gives us the, the, the fuller perspective in his further work in Acts. And so we have this time and time again, and the description also of the, of the resurrection stories. So we see that these five accounts actually do fit together in exactly the same kind of way that it, historians would expect. Eyewitness accounts aren't absolutely verbatim accounts. You would, you would expect that there'd be some kind of collusion if witnesses got together and came out verbatim with the same testimony. But no, you pick up their testimony and you bring it, put them together and you can construct the accurate history. 
And so these are eyewitnesses' accounts. They contain many corroborating cross details which would be hard to invent. And they make two simple claims. Number one, Jesus' physical body disappeared from the tomb. And number two, the risen Christ appeared to his followers. Now then, people who mock the resurrection need to understand that there's never been an adequate explanation of both of these things. Never been an adequate explanation of the disappearance of the body and the fact that these disciples gave adequate testimony to the fact that Jesus revealed himself to them in his physical body. And all these give us as a, an accurate description of events which have no logical explanation. The disciples didn't steal the body, they wouldn't die for a lie. The Roman authorities didn't steal the body, they wouldn't allow them to proclaim the resurrection, they'd have produced the body and said, no, here's the body. And there is no explanation. What about the appearances? Hallucination? 500 people don't have the same hallucination at the same time. And anyway, if they did, they wouldn't die for it. They wouldn't die for a, a hallucination. Anyway, a hallucination doesn't eat food. Hallucination can't be touched and felt. This has absolutely no comparison at all. No resemblance at all to any kind of psychological hallucination. No, this is the resurrection Jesus appearing. And it's that same Jesus who has given us his gospel to proclaim to the world. Well, we're beginning to look at some of the facts that support the gospel, to see that the gospel stands historical scrutiny and, and inquiry, but we do not rest our case solely on these events. We understand that as we preach the gospel, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit will convince that Jesus is the truth. We're going to pick up at this point in the very next session to see how we can consider the rest of the message of the gospel. God bless you till then.